Okay. Um, uh, in keeping with uh, each of our first three panels today, we begin with, with a poet, and I have the pleasure of introducing local poet Lynn Sadler. Uh, after Lynn introduces and then reads uh, her, her short poems, I will turn moderating duties over to Nancy Creamer, who will introduce our, uh, our distinguished panelists who, who uh, uh, deliver their expertise about uh, farming and gardening and changing climate. So, uh, Lynn Sadler uh, is widely published in academic and creative writing uh, and is a native North Carolinian and a former college president in Vermont. Her next poetry collection, Mola, Person, forthcoming from Ohio's Evening Street Press, has strong environmental themes, uh, including the effect of the Panama Canal on the Cuna Indians. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our fourth exceptional poet of the day, Lynn Beach Sadler. covered it except to say that I grew up on a farm in eastern North Carolina in Dupin County, Warsaw actually, about six miles out in the sticks. <laughs> so I know something about that. However, today for you, I'm reading what might have not had to happen. And the first here in this country, the second in Brunei. Collateral damage. This country has needed coal to build, grow, succeed. This country owes debts to coal. Men needed the work coal yielded. Men have given lungs for coal. Men have given lives for coal. Some men have given souls for coal. A lot more than work sells coal to Newcastle. Gold, coal dust exploded for want of rock dust covering. Timbering, terrible, entombment, fatal. Families hard scrabbled lives from home. Lives bleaker than tenant farmers. Lives bleaker than sharecroppers. Tenant farmers, sharecroppers, eked out livings on the land. Workers in coal mines had to mow under the land with canaries to sing them on their way to the great silence. Except for these swan singing canaries, I have not heard Cole's collateral damage discussed, but I do know mules sentenced to labor in coal mines never came up again. Never came up from under the land. Went blind, died, were entombed where they coal labored. If you publish this poem, I'll be entombed as Tarbellion Muckraker Mule Hugger. <laughs> My husband and I have had the good fortune to go around the world five times, and one of the most incredible moments for me was a scene in Brunei. I call this when oil and water mix. Rich when Magellan's men ate from gold and silver platters in rooms walled with silk brocades. Rich when long marble wrote played bridge at Royal Brunei's Yacht Club. Richer when oil's bo boom and boon through modern shellfare welfare state. Ancient water village, once pirate layer, surrounds gold dome Omar Ali Moss. Its prayer callers ascend by elevator. Brunei's oil and water mix. World's third largest island, still jungleated Brunei, is land bound three sides by Sarawak, the free fourth bordered by South China Sea. Stilts push wooden houses above Brunei River. Sewage slick, though generators serve television in 
satellite dishes with rice and hockey noodles. Upriver, not far, tribes dance to gongs, live in communal longhouses, climb low pipes, displace rumpling heads from grandfather's head hunting. We pass the largest lived-in palace in the world, home to Prince Charles's polo-playing sultan pal, whose spending habits beggar belief. Boxes are woven around each fruit on a tree to keep it from the birds. But when I want to see, I shan't. The proboscis long-nosed monkey, rarest in the world, and private, bashful. I want to see it, archetypal Tarzan, ride a branch from a mangrove swamp where dip a palm out and out over the lower Brunei River, hang there a knowing instant, then plummet drop into the void just to have a cooling dip, a playing swim, do parrot monkeys throw snub-nosed, slight blue-faced infants into the brink like human father and his child in pool. Adult male proboscis, bulbous huge, must be pushed aside with monkey hand the mouth to access food. Why does proboscis monkey throw proboscis? Vestigial, appendant, snorkel through the oily film? What I want to see I do and wish I not. Tropical Brunei is desiccated now, prey to fires of brush as well as oil, not so intense as in Indonesia, but smoke and hotted atmosphere make more than Muslim women mask. Returning to Port Nuara at mouth of River Brunei, we see here fire truck traffic, see, smell, taste, touch. Smoke haze, slowing us as if we slog through oil. Suddenly, out of the muted jungle, a figure steps, turns, plods, superhighways, edge, upright, but head pendant on chest. Does proboscis pull down that monkey's head? Thank you.
took a job at <laughs> Coon Rock Farm and met Brock there. And uh, now they're farming together, managing an incubator, um, or part of an incubating farm from Coon Rock Farm. And uh, you know, the average age of farming farmers now is 59, so it's really important to start bringing young people into agriculture. So they're going to talk about some of their experiences. Um, so Laura.
is that the climate scientists are really working on how do we get these projections, these projected changes in climate, how do we express them in ways that are useful to regular people? Okay. And so I want to show you just a couple of examples as uh, a little bit of a preview of the kinds of, of different ways you are going to be hearing climate discussed in the coming years. Okay, so this is, um, these are maps. The data that I'm going to show you now come from the second national climate assessment. The work that I did with USDA is informing the third national climate assessment, which is due out early next year. So these are from the second national climate assessment. So this is a look at number of days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's a period of about 20 or so years. Uh, and you can think of this as recent past or kind of current, what, what we've experienced. I like this data because I can imagine a day at over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Can, can most of y'all do that too? Yeah. 100 degrees Fahrenheit is really tough on livestock. It's really tough on crops. And it's really tough on field workers, on people too, right? So this is projection about, what is that? 60, 70 years from now. So this is almost 100 years, well, 50 years in the future. So I'm a lumper, not a splitter. So if you notice me, it's just that I'm going to kind of the overall change, right? Um, so you can take a look at that, and you can think about what it means um, to be in Texas. When the increase in the number of days over 100 degrees is, looks like it's going to be, what, 60? 70, not the increase, but the number of days in the year, right? Yeah, sorry, number of days in the year, okay? Now this is a projection for the lower emission scenario. So this is a projection um, of a certain, uh, scenarios basically describe kind of how international relations went, how different countries, what are we willing to agree to in terms of emissions reduction, use of energy, all that sort of thing. So this is a lower emission scenario and we already missed it. So this is the best uh, projection from the 2009 climate change, climate, national climate assessment in terms of where we are actually headed. So I'll give you a minute to look at that. So the starkest red areas are 90 to 100, 120 days per year over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So usually by this time, uh, if you're in the mountains, in the Appalachian Mountains, where I come from, you're starting to feel pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for our neighbors down the mountain, but, you know, until somebody in a says, oh, well, where do you think all these folks are going to go? Right? We're going to go over there. So, um, so that just gives you a sense of sort of, of the increase in temperature, average increase in temperature that we're likely to experience. Increased weather extremes, both temperatures uh, and also precipitation, are really the feature of near-term changes in climate. Uh, this is again some data on the left of uh, what we could consider current conditions. This is uh, observed increases in very heavy precipitation from 1958 to well, about 50 years. Okay. And what you can see is the darker the blue, the more increase in heavy, very heavy precipitation. That looks like the northeast is getting soft in the west too. Mm -hmm. Does everybody understand that? That map that that's shown, increasing very heavy precipitation does. And then, Very heavy has a very specific definition, and I don't know. Okay, and it's it, it's it's a relative measure, and it'll make more sense when I show you the projection. Okay, okay. Um, and then this is the projection. This is percent change along the along the y-axis, along the x-axis is uh, low precipitation, moderate, and heaviest. So that that's where it makes more sense to think about very heavy precipitation 
relative to these different kinds of these different precipitation events. So we have lightest, moderate, heaviest. And what this projection show is that, and again, you've got this lower emission is the yellow and the red is the higher emission scenario. We've already missed the lower emission scenario. So you can just look at those red bars or orange bars. And what this shows is that, again, this is about 70 years from now or so. Um, what this shows is that we're going to have less light precipitation events and much more heavy precipitation events. So what this is really showing you is that um, one of the changes that we expect is increased extremes in weather events. So very heavy rainfalls, not a whole lot of change actually in overall precipitation, but the water's going to be delivered in, in extreme events, very heavy precipitation. And we'll have a long period with no rain, and then another very heavy precipitation event. And all that has very severely complicates agricultural production in the field. I also wanted to show you, mostly just to show you it exists. Uh, I don't really want to go through it, but you can take a look at it for just a minute. This is the um, change in annual temperature on the left-hand side here in yellow, and change in annual on the right hand side in blues. And this is now for the southeast. So new and, and more and more will be available data, regional data. Uh, what you can see from this, so you've got the annual changes up top and the seasonal changes. Winter, spring, fall, and summer. Now this starts getting useful to a farmer or a gardener or really a homeowner. You can start to see what those projections, uh, projected changes look like. So what are some key Southeast impacts from a near-term climate change effects? First of all, there will be increased heat-related stresses, drought periods, and extreme weather events. Extreme weather will be thunderstorms, tornadoes, hurricanes. Warmer winters and warmer nights all year round. And interesting to me was uh, the, when I learned that you know, this increase in temperature, there are actually, from, from an agricultural point of view, more significant effects from the warmer, low temperatures than from the warmer, high temperatures that we want to see. So warmer winters, warmer lows in the winter, and then warmer lows in the sun. Well, often we do. So nighttime temperatures will be warm. Little major ecosystem disruptions and novel pests, and these disruptions will occur because there will be lots of shifting of ranges of all kinds of species. Sea level rise is, is not likely to cause uh, direct disruptions for much of our state, but certainly they'll be shifting in people as a result of sea level rise. So we'll likely to see some disruptions there, and then major quality of life effects from the synergy, the synergy of these impacts. One thing that's really sobering is to think about a year in which maybe we had a late spring freeze followed by a, a severe summer drought, followed by a really big hurricane in the fall. Thinking like a farmer, it's not a whole lot you're going to be able to do to recover from that many uh, multiple extreme weather events in the same season. And then, added to the complexity of all this, insurance will get harder and harder to get. Okay, so that's the bad news. Let's move on to the good news. That's the sobering part of the report. Now let's talk about some of the hopeful So it turns out there's been a lot of folks for a lot of years in other countries thinking about how do we deal with this climate change challenge. And there's a good body of knowledge and a lot of conceptual development uh, around this idea of adaptation. 
What is it? How do we do it? How do we talk about it? How do we begin to think about it? So I just want to share with you a little bit of that, and then I'm going to go into some specifics about agriculture. So this new uh, unprecedented challenge, we can call it climate risk. There's always risks in life. We all deal with them every day. And this is just another one. It happens to be a very challenging risk, but we can manage, we can think about climate risk just like we might think about any other sort of risk. Climate risk has two parts. The first part is the exposure, the, the amount of risk in any particular system. It could be a farm, it could be a home, it could be a community. It could be a capital city in a southeast state. Um, but climate risk has two parts. First, the exposure, and that's the degree to which that system experiences climate change events, climate-related events. What are, what is, let's, we'll think about Raleigh since we're here. What kinds of climate-related events will, uh, will Raleigh experience? Storms, droughts, um, higher CO2 concentrations, those kinds of experiences. Um, those kinds of events. So that's exposure. The other part of climate risk is uh, adaptive capacity. And that's the ability of the system to cope with the climate related events. How does the city respond in a drought? Are there, are there plants to uh, take care of our water needs? Um, how does the city respond when a hurricane happens? And uh, in the same way, you could think about this as a farm too. How well can that system respond to those climate change effects and adapt to them? How cope with them? Together, exposure and adaptive capacity uh, determine the vulnerability of a system that is experiencing climate change events. So the question then becomes, how vulnerable is the system under your management? Again, this could be a town, it could be a family, it could be a farm. First of all, you to figure this out, to figure out the climate risk that you're facing, the vulnerability of the system, uh, think about first key exposures. Some key exposures in the southeast are CO2 and average temperature increases, higher low and high temps, increasing mother variability, greater number of more intense extreme events, and then multiple impacts or increase the risk. So those are part of some key exposures in the southeast. To think about, think through, describe the adaptive capacity of the system. First of all, you want to think about critical sensitivities. Are there aspects of that system that are particularly sensitive to a specific climate-related event? So, for example, if we're thinking about a farm, and we're thinking about a climate event of a late freeze, if you're an apple grower, that can mean you've lost your crop for the year. So that's a pretty classic example of a, a very sensitive system to a very specific exposure. Does that make sense? Okay, so I want to look at sensitivities of the system to specific climate events. You can also then think about the resilience of the system. What does that mean? That means how well can that system respond to, to um, adjust in the face of that disturbance of that event. And finally, you want to think about recovery reserves. If you are that apple grower and you experience that late freeze, what kinds of recovery reserves do you have? Is there insurance? Do you have some savings? Do you have a backup plan? So you put all this into a vulnerability assessment. And what we've got here is exposure along this axis and adaptive capacity along this axis. And together, they describe the climate risk. And what you hope you can do is keep your farm or your city in this part of this matrix, right? Now, localities don't really have a lot of control over exposure. That's more national, international. It's also it's mitigation. This is a 
mitigation uh, work. But because the climate system is shared and it's global, this kind of uh, working on exposure to try to bring your system into this level uh, really is more than your national and national issue. The good news is adaptive capacity is very much a local issue. And localities can do a lot to improve the adaptive capacity, to move their system towards that high end, which then takes you into this more comfortable level of vulnerability. The other thing I wanted to let you know is that since uh, 2009 or so, the federal government has been very busy thinking about adaptation, how they can support adaptation of localities. Lots of different reports out there. This is the report that I was involved in, USDA. We have a federal uh, climate change adaptation task force. Since 2009, all federal agencies have been coming up with adaptation plans for their agency, how they're going to continue to function in the face of climate change. Um, and a couple of other, other examples, EPA has been working very hard on um, lots of different aspects of climate change adaptation. Um, there's an example of the indicators report. Um, and there's just this year released uh, fish, wildlife, and plant climate adaptation strategy. Forest Service has released a, a, forest service at the, a forest adaptation strategy. And we have this National Climate Assessment uh, Project of the Global Change Research Program. So there's really a lot of thinking going on now uh, in our country about how to address the challenge. So I wanted to finish up by just uh, giving you some examples of how you how localities can manage uh, adaptive capacity and enhance adaptive capacity. And there's three different strategies available to um, localities. And uh, they're not, you can move back and forth along this continuum for resistance, resilience, and transformation. Um, but, typic, but in general, um, resistance strategies are um, useful in the near term, but will fail over time, become more expen expensive, and fail over time. So we really want to be thinking about moving into this resilience phase and possibly ultimately transformation phase. I'm going to give you examples of all three of these phases for agriculture. Here's some resistance practices. And here the strategy is to accept the increased costs and more risk to maintain existing production systems, so existing farm systems. So some of the kinds of changes we'll see in agriculture um, to manage water. Remember, we've got these extremes, this variable, variability in water, droughts followed by very wet periods. Um, some of the kinds of uh, adaptive responses that we'll see, we actually already seen in the Midwest. Equipment needed for well, getting new equipment, larger equipment, needed to um, improve the flexible kind of field operations. So what's going on in the Midwest is they're buying larger and larger equipment because the windows of time they have to work in the field is getting shorter and shorter, so they won't be able to jump in there and get the work done when they get done. Uh, there are, right now in the Midwest, lots of irrigation and drainage systems being put in, large-scale irrigation and drainage systems, again, to address drought and to address too much water. Um, and then flood control, flood control structures. Lots of uh, shoring up and raising of dikes going on in the Midwest. We're seeing in North Carolina a lot of irrigation, irrigation being put into place. To try to manage temperatures, um, there's a lot of adjustment in field operations. Go into the field later, go into the field earlier, depending on if you're experiencing warmer springs or cooler springs. Um, and then also using physical production and space conditioning to control the temperatures in the agricultural systems. To 
manage these new and novel pests and diseases. We've got to integrate pest management, physical protection, and also the increased use of pesticides. And finally, to manage climate risk, uh, farmers are beginning to do vulnerability assessment, looking at what kinds of risks they're most vulnerable to and how to address them. And also, uh, they have production insurance to be able to help them with the recovery reserves. So, the best knowledge out there about adaptation is that resistance is futile. Over the long term, it's going to get more expensive, it's going to fail. So really, where we want to be thinking and where a lot of the federal government thinking is going is into resilience. So in terms of agriculture, uh, the strategy, well, in general, the strategy for resilience practices are to reduce risk through robust ecosystem design. So what that means is that we're trying to design ecosystems. And this could be true for a city or for a farm. I'll talk about farms. But we're designing this ecosystem to increase its ability to adjust to a disturbance by a climate change event and keep right on going. So what does that mean on the farm? What kinds of practices do you see? First of all, you want to build soil health. Great knowledge base out there that healthy soils will help to manage variability both in temperature and particularly in precipitation. Uh, healthy soils will help to reduce pest pressures, these new and novel pests that we'll be seeing in agriculture. You can also integrate robust crops and livestock. Yes? Are you suggesting genetically modified organisms here? Am I suggesting the robust? Yeah. Actually, absolutely not. I don't think that GMO organisms are going to be able to help with creating robust what, what GMO, what uh, genetic engineering is really good at doing is addressing a specific known issue, right? Um, the idea of robust crops and livestock are those, those um, varieties, cultivars, breeds that are really good at weathering whatever comes along. They're very thrifty, they're, um, what are some of the other words, we any livestock? Growers here with me. Um, livestock farmers have words for these kinds of crops. They're tough, you know. They can they can handle a freeze or a right. So it's that kind of thing. That's what robust means. That's what hardy. Hardy. Thank you. That is the word I was looking for. All right. Um, so integrate robust crops and livestock, and that's kind of a tricky term there because I'm not just saying let's have robust crops or let's have robust Livestock, I'm saying you've got to put them together on the same farm. That's part of the resilience equation. Okay, or you got to have a neighbor and you'll have to do a lot of collaborating to create this resilient system. Um, you want to use all kinds of practices. I'm going to show you some examples. Patch, soar, and conserve water. It's going to be really important and we're going to have to do that a lot more in the state. Coming years. Manage the farm state. That means stop thinking just about the field, but start thinking about the whole farm and how that landscape is integrated and what that landscape can do to help create resilience to these climate change effects. Use adaptive management. This is a very specific kind of management that is particularly good at managing uncertainties. And I'll give you an example of that in a For the near term, we have the recommendation is to focus on no regrets adaptation. What does that mean? That means taking steps that improve the resilience of your farm. And even if all the climate scientists are wrong, still improve your productivity, your profitability. In other words, it's a win, no matter what. Right? So it's a whole, there's a whole, there's lots of examples of these no regrets adaptations. And then finally, if you're planning something long term, a new orchard, a winery, or any kind of long-term investment in your farm, new buildings, new infrastructure of some kind, really good idea for you to do your best to get some climate information and include that in the planning. Some examples of robust crops and 
some livestock. Some of them are old varieties, some of them are new varieties. Um, anybody got gardeners out there? You ever heard of black seeded Simpsons and the old lettuce variety? Well, it turns out it's really robust to changes in temperature in the spring. So we have a hot wave, a lot of lettuces, what will they do? They'll, they'll go ahead and they'll head. And so um, black seeded Simpson does a little bit of information known about this particular lettuce, and it's actually very robust to that. We'll continue right on staying in the vegetative phase, even if, if you had a little heat wave in the spring. Um, the, the, the cow on top is a sahal. I'm not sure how you say that, sahibal. Um, it is a breed that comes from South Africa. It's being used in Texas to breed in robust uh, dairy cattle, to breed the dairy cattle that are robust to high temperatures. Um, so they're very, they're hardy, they're thrifty, and they can produce a lot of milk even when it's hot. Uh, red orac, anybody heard about this? It's kind of the new cool vegetable out there. Uh, it's more nutritious than spinach, and it's much more robust to uh, in variable temperatures. So either a uh, heat wave in the spring or or uh, dropping the temperature as well. And then finally, this example of Dorset Golden, it's an apple that has a very low chill period. It doesn't need a lot of cold weather in the winter to go ahead and, and initiate flowering and fruiting. Um, you can grow Dorset Golden apples in the tropics. Okay, just a few examples of robust crops and livestock. There's a whole bunch of really important work to be done learning about the existing crops and livestock that we have and how robust they are. Not a, there's no, you can't go to one place in proper extension and find a list of robust crops and livestock. That's work that needs to be done. This is an example of the uh, Creating robust uh, robustness to pests. I'm going to go into the details here too much, but I just want to show you that we actually have a great knowledge base also for ecological pest management. The shorthand for that is mini little hammers. So you're not just waiting for the pest to arrive and then using pesticides, but you're manipulating and managing the whole farm system to just suppress pest numbers. You do that through habitat conservation and enhancement. Um, you can enhance the officials or the enemies of the pests. You can build healthy soils and there's lots of other practices. The main idea is that you grow very healthy plants and as a result they will be able to get a healthy environment on the farm and that will suppress pests and help plants to, to resist pest damage. Now so I wanted to show you a few uh, practices that may be useful in our state, in our country. They're currently being used in other countries that are experiencing climate change, perhaps a little more intensely right now. One of these is um, a key line design to manage water and landscape. This comes from Australia. It's a permaculture technique. And uh, you're basically looking at your whole farm as a way to capture your whole landscape, as a way to capture and encourage water to move where you'd like it to move, to store it on your land so you have it for use. It involves the use of a plow, a specific kind of plow. You can see these lines are drawn in our uh, plow and see your landscape, and it just moves water into a series of ponds. It's all gravity fed, and it creates water storage on your farm and also controls water moving through your farm, particularly useful during extreme and fall events. Uh, there's a new, new research going on with Eli Design in California, and that's the organization for that. I think there's a lot of potential in Eli Design in North Carolina. So another more forward-thinking practices, um, they could come under this term of farmscaping, and that's where you're thinking about the whole landscape on your farm and how you can manage it for resilience. Um, you think about edges, what can you do on the edges of fields? Uh, you can think about topography and how you might manage topography to create warm pockets or cool pockets um, to manage these microclimates. You can think about riparian areas, particularly as uh, rescue areas for animals. The pictures here show cows in the water. You normally wouldn't let them do that, but if it's a drought and 
we're having a heat wave, maybe that's how they can help benefit through that hot period. Um, we create edges for shade and to manage wetlands, both for the uh, resilience of your farm, but also if you manage wetlands, you're helping with flood issues in your community as well. So lots of really forward-thinking uh, ideas out there. Uh, a lot of these ideas come from permaculture, a type of, of ecological agriculture that's called permaculture. So I think there's a lot of good, good ideas there for you to consider. I said I want to talk a little bit about adaptive management. This is a management practice that is particularly useful in uncertainty, when there's high uncertainty um, and poor knowledge about the ability of a particular practice to work under certain conditions. Um, basically, it's a management cycle that involves making <coughs> visions and goals, assessing your resources, and that would typically include vulnerability assessment. You make a plan. And this is the key. A lot, a lot of businesses do a lot of this. This is the key part of adaptive management. It's really important. You have to monitor the plan. You monitor the system under management, in this case a farm, and you see how, it, how, it, how the changes that you made did. You monitor your resilience. And then if it's all working great, on you go around the cycle. But if it's not, you replan, you change, and you're still continuously learning about how that system and management responds to climate change effects. The last type of practice I wanted to mention, this is really getting a little bit out of the literature now. It's more um, visioning and kind of a little bit of wild ideas. Um, the strategy is to reduce risk through self-regulating ecosystem design that's dependent on local and renewable resources. Shorthand for this slide is local food. Okay, yeah, yeah, local food. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, it's basically local food or re-regionalizing agriculture. Um, there's a lot of good information. There's a lot of literature around, around this idea. On farm, what do transformation practices need? They need robust crop and livestock, enterprises, production systems. I've already described you some more that looks like. A focus on renewables and on soft adaptations. It's just another word really for no regrets adaptations. Um, a little more into the future, the thinking is we will probably need to convert cropland to pasture and forest. You can think about permaculture there as well. And then use climate smart management. So uh, in the future, it's envisioned that we'll actually have enough good information about climate to be able to use it in uh, seasonal farm management. This also means more than just changes on the farm. It means changes in the food system. Consumers, eaters, y'all folks, we need to uh, demand seasonal diets. That's what we need. And also to demand regional production and processing. So this is really this idea of relocalizing agriculture. So some key actions now. First, uh, with the nod of Bill and Kevin, recognize your farm on a new planet. Or if you're mostly eaters, recognize your eating on a new planet. Begin monitoring farm performance. So you can start with that adaptive management there. How's your farm doing in an extreme event? Address the key farm vulnerabilities, so conduct a vulnerability assessment on your farm in, in addressing the most vulnerable areas. Draw on existing knowledge, local experience, and experience from going south. Those folks on the south have been dealing with uh, at least hotter temperatures for a long time, and maybe get some ideas from that. Use no regrets, adaptation to enhance that capacity. Use climate change projections in longer term decisions. Yep, sorry. Uh, yes? Does Steve's truck learn about any of these things? I don't know. <laughs> I've been trying to behave myself so far in all of this. But I'm getting ready to not, I mean, I'm here. I'm, I decided to stop behaving myself. Yeah. Okay, so I want to move on to.
Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Karen and Joe. We see we live at the farmer's market for you know we get us out of here and uh, be able to talk to you guys. Um, just as kind of a background, both of us have been working for about three years now at Twin Rock Farm in Hillsborough, North Carolina. We both went to UNC Chapel Hill and somehow decided agriculture was for us through various experiences and luckily found a partner who was similarly minded. Um, Kudok Farm, actually, as we thought about this, there were a number of things that we had brainstormed, but in listening to the presentations, it's kind of funny how much sustainable farms incorporate just in an adaptive capacity mindset. Um, so Coon Rock is kind of a multi-species, multi-enterprise farm, grass fed beef, pasture-raised poultry, pasture-raised pork, grass fed lamb, um, got honeybees, fruits, vegetables, just a little bit of everything. Uh, I think it's a fine line between doing enough to where you have that resilience, but not doing so much to where you're spread too thin. Um, so for both of us, we really enjoyed it, and it's something we hope to pursue. Right now, we're managing a separate property for Coon Rock. The farm itself is 55 acres, and we manage a 260-acre property. I'm still the livestock manager for Coon Rock, so I run all the animals. Um, Mary Beth is in charge of the garden out there, and most certainly helps me with the animals, and kind of, we both help each other in that respect. So it's a great opportunity for us to continue to work with uh, Coon Rock Farm itself also be able to grow and we go into our enterprise. So it's a little bit more fun for us. Um, I'll let Mary Beth kind of go into some of the stuff that we have uh, come up with. Okay. Um, so um, I was a little surprised when Karen asked us to speak here because we are by no means experts. Um, we've been farming for three years since 2010. Um, although Wendell Berry says eating is an agricultural act, so I think by his definition, combined 50 years. Um, <laughs> so, um, but I think that we are in a unique situation, um, being in our mid-20s and beginning farming at a time when climate change is so imminent. Um, and like the slide that the USDA said that um, at the current pace of the intensity, um, it creates this unprecedented challenge. Um, the, the statistic that I tend to dwell on is that um, in the next 10 years, 50% of American farmers will be at retirement age. Um, and that's a little terrifying. There are not many, there are a lot of young farmers, um, but there are not a lot. There are not 50% of American farmers to fill that. Um, and so we're sort of in a unique situation coming into farming at a time when things are really beginning to change. Um, and we were talking to Lauren and Nancy before and, and saying like, we have not been doing this for 30 years, we have no basis for comparison um, about climate change. Um, we know that this year was very different than last year. We had 85 degree days in March last year um, and it sleeted at our, at our farm two weeks ago. Um, our tomatoes are still inside. Um, I do not let those babies out until I know it's not going to freeze. Um, so it's, yeah, and looking at your slides, I kind of like, am I crazy to do this? <laughs> Should I run? Should I walk right out the door? Um, I, so yeah, there, um, like Ron was saying, when you're brainstorming ideas or our experience, um, the things that we do to try to manage um, for climate change um, in the future, the decisions that we're making are going to impact farming generations to come. Um, you know, we are going to do things like integrated pest management, pest management mulching, um, drip irrigation to conserve water, we do passive solar. Um, sustainable agriculture is all about working with natural systems. Um, not working against them. Um, talking about robust livestock and crops, um, we use heirloom varieties. There are thousands of different types of tomatoes out there. Um, you don't have to grow just one. Um, you don't have to grow just one variety. We have a bunch of different types of livestock on our property. Turkeys, chickens, um, 
You know, I was raised in North Carolina, tried to live in New York, did not work out. Um, there are certain crops that just do not work here. Um, and so there are, it, it, it is possible, um, but you have to do your research and um, it means just choosing crop varieties that are inherently resistant um, and resilient. I wanted to talk about um, opportunities with climate change, but there are some. And, and I think one of the biggest issues is kind of looking at that slide the comparison of global warming versus climate change. And I think more of the opportunities come um, from the global warming aspect with increasing temperatures in some respects. Um, I think one thing is just taking advantage of looking south and looking at other climates and crops that may actually be able to be grown here. Fruit trees to other varieties, which again makes it accessible to consumers. You're offering more products, and for farmers, it's keeping more that would be global. Um, initially, this past year, with the severe drought, an opportunity for us, I say a sustainable ag, is almost kind of disadvantaged for conventional ag. So when you look at the production systems that really rely upon commodity grain in the Midwest, this past year was a horrible drought. So anyone who's feeding grain cows and feedlots in Dodge City, Kansas, their prices went up. And some of that is passed along to consumers, not near as much as how it should be in subsidies and everything else. But I believe it will come to a point with all these variabilities of people who are in the Asian modern cultural systems. They actually will have to raise food prices and deal with these systems, draw more consumers to look at what at this point is more expensive production with its pastures or uh, grass to be grass and land, but it is something that has a much more stable kind of price point if you're doing it. Um, if you own the land, you have to manage your resilient system. So for that, it's almost drawing more consumers to the sustainable ag movement, which we see as an opportunity. Um, I think another one is that we can actually work with the animals. So one of our adaptive capacities, we're all at the same exposure risk. Um, our adaptive capacities are working with the animals themselves, and this is my specific area. Um, there's a statistic in reading up on it that cows, black Angus cows, kind of been what the industry has been focused on for years. And the statistic is at least 50, or at least 80 percent of the cow herd in the United States has 50 percent black Angus. Um, if you have a black hide on a cow, you get more per pound in the stockyard. Um, that doesn't work for us. Black cows heat up more in the hot North Carolina summer. So for us, we actually breed for color. We breed for red cows, white cows, something that will actually be able to withstand these heat extremes. Um, it's a 30 degree difference on the hot air between a black cow and a red cow in the summer. So for us to be able to selectively breed these animals on the farm, microclimate specific to Coon Rock Farm or where we're at, um, it's already a good business practice for us as sustainable. Farmers get in something that I believe is going to become more and more an asset as time goes on and you have to deal with this. Yet at the same time, you deal with the climate change side of it. And as robust and resilient the system as you have, working with natural ecosystems, you get those curveballs. And that's something I think that terrifies me more than anything else, is having to deal with those climatic variations where you may have a set where you only have in a certain month, but if you get freezing temperatures and sleep in early April, when you're going to do it, and that's not really the case. There's really no way to deal with that except for relying upon the animals and do the best you can. Um, and even then, nature can go on to bring that kind of So for us, it's, it's been really exciting, I think, starting down this path. I mean, agriculture can be daunting before you look at it from a climate change perspective. Um, but I do think there's a lot of people, especially in this community, that there's a lot of people to draw from their experiences and even just the research that people do in this area to uh, give us a good basis to start from. But no, again, thank you for having us up here and uh, we're glad to answer any questions. Bye. So Kunok Farm itself is 55 acres. Um, yeah. And we can y'all hear me, or 
No? Okay. Um, yeah, so it's 55 acres, and the one that we manage is 260 acres. So on that is a two-acre garden that we manage ourselves. Um, but for the grass-fed production, that needs a lot more of the land. And that's something, again, I agree with, with shifting a lot of the cropland that we have, especially in the Midwest and other places, to pastures and forests, things like that. Um, it's amazing, even raising pork and other things. As much as you can get them out there foraging with these hardy wild trees for nuts, grubs, everything else, you can really cut down on costs and allow yourself to adapt and become more competitive as opposed to someone who's putting hogs in a house. They're gonna have to pump cool air in there to keep the climate the exact same and they're feeding 100% grain. The two of you mentioned um, diversity as a major thing, but I was really surprised that you didn't mention monocultures as one of the major problems. It's like banks are too big to fail. I mean, if one field is all one crop, that's not a resilience. You didn't mention that once. Is there a reason? I just I was focusing on practices along that continuum of adaptive capacity. So we could have a discussion about what's not working in industrial agriculture, um, if you'd like. Yes, mono, monoculture is very it is would be very difficult to manage in a resilient way. Although interesting to me is there is a I would say parallel and and I thought Brock was very. Uh, insightful to notice that what a, resilience practices are all very common sustainable agriculture practices and the transition and the transformative practices I, I even let you know that's really local food re-regionalizing agriculture um, but in the, there's a parallel discussion going on about uh, industrial agriculture being the resilient agriculture of the future if you think about those, re those resistance practices, one of them was space conditioning. Do you remember that? We're just going to create the right environment for the crop. And the idea of the right environment would be to move agriculture indoors completely. And what I immediately think of is Wendell Berry's Unsettling of America. And the last chapter of that book was he imagined robots running through warehouses growing the food, right? The food in, in agriculture. So there is an interesting sort of an alternative argument that, that um, industrial agriculture is more, would be the resilient way to go because of the ability to, to control the environment. Uh, is anyone giving any serious thought to farming with less fossil fuel? I was on a trip through Virginia, Central Virginia, farmland last summer, and it was amazing how much farm equipment there is on farm. Tractors, trucks, every kind of machine you have ever. They all run as fossil fuel. Do you all learn anything to take yeah, I, just as a starting point, any piece of machinery I fear is going to break. Diesel fuel aside, so anything I don't have to use machinery-wise, one less thing I have to fix. Um, but from an actual fuel standpoint, it's something that we try to use animals as much as possible to do the work for us in terms of reducing fossil fuels. So one of the biggest principles we use is introducing animals and crops at the right time with each other. So once we finish a crop, we'll run hogs through there. It doesn't do a whole lot for their feed, but it's almost their health care between tomatoes we didn't catch or potatoes we didn't dig up, stuff for them to root up, being in a natural setting, eating bugs, crops. They've tilled it up. We put grain through it and we supplement it. Um, their feed, they're fertilizing at the same time so we don't have to drive over it. But I think a lot of that shift to fewer fossil fuels is shifting the actual size of farms if you're going to be doing intensive horticultural production. You could do hundreds if not thousands of acres with cattle through intensive grazing and the like, which is actually one of the best ways to sequester carbon and actually combat climate change by actually running these animals in such a way that they're just eating the grass, you're not putting any fossil fuel into it. I can move 65 cows in, in a minute. 
I just open a gate, they walk to the next paddock. Um, so for that, it's a way to not have to use machinery. And for us, it's just almost a principle we take for granted that we're not going to use as many fossil fuels because we use what the animals can do, what we can get out of natural systems. While they're doing management tensor grazing. Yeah, so they're doing a practice called management tensor grazing. And uh, we do that at the college farm where I work as well. And what I tell the students is, we have this really cool new solar powered hay harvester. Have you seen it? Have you seen it? And they're like, I don't know. It's the cows, right? They're, they're going around. That's what, that's what rock means, doing the work doing the work themselves, getting the animals to do the work so you don't have to go cut that hay and put it in a barn and feed it all winter. Um, so that's one way that sustainable practices reduce the use of fossil fuels. Uh, I spent uh, in Cuba last June uh, seeing some of the sustainable agricultural products and how they have done so well to diminish the amount of fossil fuels that they use in the agriculture. And one of the big issues for urban farming, you know, rooftop farming, and all those kind of stuff, we haven't seen the idea of that here. Um, but the other thing was burnt, you know, burnt. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's amazing what worms you do to help the soil um, stay fertile. And you were talking about how important so eating the soil uh, healthy is. Uh, we have a big problem here, and I don't even have to worms, but we should be eating more. I mean, we do eat them, but I don't think we eat them on the scale of like humans do. But uh, the, the one negative thing that I think we do do is not just soil, I mean, it's certainly not enough soil. One thing that I think frustrates me is I'm a very firm proponent in using multiple species in conjunction with crop production. Um, some things that frustrate me are organic farmers who use, whether it's feather meal or these, or the poultry manure from chicken houses. It's a waste stream that's coming out that I feel as though those companies have to deal with, and we're kind of letting them off easy. Um, yet there's people who do great things, and it's dealing with that waste stream. Um, so it's kind of, it's striking that balance there. And I can't speak specifically to kind of the municipal sludge that they spray, but it, it truly is kind of, I think we do have to identify some waste streams we can use. I believe it's actually at Charlotte Douglas, they have a huge vermiculture operation um, where they're running a lot of the food waste from the airport, if I'm not mistaken. Um, which, again, it's just those innovative ideas that municipalities can use, that they have this organic material on a large scale that, again, can support local farmers by providing a low-cost additive. And municipal sludge certainly isn't the answer in all cases, but I think there's other ways they can manage that. Um, what struck me in that continuum of adaptation is how um, much tracks from the monocultural, industrial, up to the local, um, one machine to the other. So um, at the same time, it, the dichotomy between mitigation and adaptation is kind of artificial. And that a lot of those practices are also mitigation for the way that we use land and land use is a major contributor to climate change. Um, also, um, the fact that um, localized food systems are very much dependent on policies on the national scale, like the farm bill and subsidies that we get one form of farm versus another. So I, I encourage um, or I'd like to hear 
better understand better um, why that dichotomy should exist. Uh, Wendell Berry has been quoted a lot in, in this panel, and he speaks a lot about how abstract you know, the global is. That we are really human, there is no such thing as global, we are or we are. So, um, but this question of, um, especially given that there's a point of no return, and scientists are saying that the point of being to mitigate climate change and we're there after reach points of um, ongoing climate change. So there, there, it's kind of this um, danger that I sense in, in focusing on the adaptation aspect of things when you have to be doing both simultaneously, especially since um, adaptation at one point becomes definitely not enough because it's only going to get worse the point you can't get. Yeah, in no way did I mean to suggest that there isn't work to be done around mitigation. The distinction between mitigation and adaptation that I made is the distinction that the IPCC makes. Um, certainly there are some adaptive actions that also help to mitigate. Um, but the, uh, the place where most of the decision making has to take place in mitigation for it to be effective is more national and international. That's the distinction I was making. Certainly as citizens, we can, we can affect that process. And absolutely, we need to be doing both. But the, I think one of the hopeful messages in the adaptation work that our literature that I reviewed for the report, and it's what I try to share with people, is that Adaptation is much more local in nature, so you can begin to have an effect on the ability of your community or your farm to weather these near-term changes in climate. And so let's get going on that. And there's a lot of good information already there for us to begin adapting to the near-term challenges. At the same time, um, national policy absolutely can support or present barriers to adaptation. Um, so I think all of your comments are absolutely right, and I didn't mean to suggest that's all we need to think about is adaptation, but I think that that's where at the local level we can begin making, making some significant um, improvements in adaptive capacity. And given the state of the international and national discourse around mitigation, that's hopeful to me, that at least on the adaptation dimension we can begin making some positive changes. Does that make sense? Did I address you? Yeah. Did you want to say something about that? My question is, looking at the whole agricultural uh, sector, what is the chance, I mean, I understand it's safe, sustainable, uh, and organic food movements, and more kind of localism, and all that sort of thing, that's a very progressive and, and um, sector that understands the dangers of climate change Organization and so on. But with the rest, you would think that the rest of the agricultural movement of the ag business and so on would, would have begin to start to take seriously climate change and start to be a force for dealing with uh, it, um, it, dealing with mitigation. Do you see any of that? I, I mean, if, if climate change is going to bite their butt, <laughs> you know. Do you see any wake up happening in, in the larger ag business, at Farm Bureau, those guys? Um, yeah, I do see wake up. And, and actually, a really interesting um, result of this distinction, but one of the positive results or outcomes of the distinction between mitigation and adaptation is that the large-scale agriculture, industrial agriculture in this country are all over adaptation. They are very excited to think about how to reduce climate risk. And a lot of the language around adaptation is using, is kind of business language. And so I think that, um, so there are, uh, there is an embrace of adaptation and it's actually in the adaptation message that you find big ag coming into the picture and beginning to think about some of these issues. And there's, a, and there's quite a bit of research being done, um, or beginning to be done, to help 
big ag adapt to some of these changes. The tricky thing is it's so political, and it has been so political, this is discussion. Um, and the other tricky thing is that up until now, if, if, you, if you talk with farmers, there's not a whole lot of research in the US, but there is a lot of research from Canada and uh, European Union and Australia. And what farmers who are asked about it say is we can handle this. We can handle this. Um, if you give us the technology and you give us the, the government support that we need, we can handle this challenge. And I understand that uh, confidence, but I also think that it's, it's confidence that is, is a little misplaced because of this unprecedented nature, because of the unprecedented nature of this challenge. It's a little bit too much to go into here, but I, I feel like I could really support what I'm saying if we were to talk about it a little bit longer. Um, so there is movement going on around this issue of adaptation in the big community. Well, I know we can probably move on to the next one. Um, so I'm going to ask Jeff to just want to thank our speakers. They did a great job.